right. So I'm going to talk with you about streets. Streets right here in Tucson. And our beautiful tour begins in a classic Tucson street in a style I call Frontier Automobile Settlement. <laughs> or pre-Mad Max. Um, so no, this is a classic uh, Tucson street. And um, before I talk about the transformation that's happening on our streets and our built environment, I want to just share a little bit about where we're coming from. And so this street, if you're a car, is fabulous, right? You can probably fit five of you abreast. And uh, it's great because it's just a residential street. But if you're a human being or any other kind of living being, plant or animal, it's not really the best environment for you. First of all, it's really hot. That asphalt collects sun all day radiates it all night, it makes it hotter here, which makes the air dirtier actually, and it makes us run the AC more, so we burn more coal. The second thing this street does, all that asphalt, is it prevents water from sinking back into the soil as it once did in the natural environment. And one of the big results of that is the creation of Elvira Lake at the Stone, End Stone Avenue underpass. Now, this provides excellent recreational opportunities, <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, it's very hard on our infrastructure, it's risky, it's a maintenance headache, and it's also a tremendous waste. I mean, look at how much water that is. Um, the other thing that is a result of paving over our uh, built environment is then we take that asphalt and concrete and we drip automobile oil and brake pad dust and even the asphalt itself, dog poop, everything. And anytime it rains, it all just washes right off of that, making the asphalt nice and clean and smell nice, and sends it into our washes, which is where the wildlife lives and also where our groundwater gets recharged, where surface water goes back into the ground. So slowly, what's in that cup is making it back to what we drink. Um, and so the dominant paradigm up until this point has been manage the stormwater as a waste product, something to get out of the system as quickly as possible. And we've used what's now called gray infrastructure, systems of pipes and channels, concrete, etc., to get water out of the system as quickly as possible. And like that uh, residential street, it's really good at one thing preventing flooding or reducing flooding. And it's not so good at providing wildlife habitat, allowing water to percolate back down into the ground, reducing that heat island effect, any of those other services that we would like, it's not so good at. And so what do we do? We, this, is, this strategy has been around for decades. Let's uh, vegetate our cities to turn them into a more livable place. The trees can clean the air and the soil, make it more beautiful, et cetera. So what do we do? We take the trees and we put them up on these raised planting areas. And so when it rains, to be sure, a little bit of water will sink in that soil. But if it rains a little bit more, the water just starts spilling back off, in this case, into the parking lot, and from there into the street, down into the wash, et cetera. Well, um, so if there's, there's one thing I want you to take away from this evening, it's just to remember this shift in thinking that is taking place. I'm sure many of you have been involved in this, and I learned this little trick from other practitioners, other innovators in the field. So imagine this is our little planting areas. We've got our raised planters. There's a little tree sticking out of each one. Here comes the rain, big monsoon storm. Woo! Whoa. Well... <laughs> So obviously all the rain goes away, right? So if we take this and this and just flip it upside down and put those earthen areas to receive the water instead of to shed it, here comes the rain and what happens, right? Some of it still flows off. Some of it still goes to the wash, but the rest of it stays where that plant can use it. So everything I'll show you from this point on is just that muffin tin turned upside down. And so, as you leave this evening and go out into your world, put your muffin tin glasses on and observe. <laughs> <clears throat> so here's how it looks. 
in real life. Uh, this is uh, not too far from here, just south of the U of A. Water flows down the street. We cut the curb and create a basin in the earth between the curb and sidewalk that can capture some of that water. And right next to that, we have uh, plants planted. Their base of the trees are high and dry, but their roots are soaking up that water. And here's what it, uh, that site looks like after about a year. So over that time, water's been coming in off the street, sinking into the ground, getting cleaned by the soil and the plant roots and the microbes. And those trees are growing, and they're shading the sidewalk. They're beautifying the neighborhood. They're shading where you park your car. And they're providing habitat for birds, butterflies, bees. Here's what one of those sites can look like after about a decade or 15 years. This is not a mile and a half from here in the Dunbar Spring neighborhood at Brad Lancaster's house. This isn't the Tucson Botanical Gardens. This is a sidewalk in a Tucson neighborhood that collects stormwater from the street to grow vegetation. The city of Tucson's getting in on the game as well. Uh, major innovators in this area. This is Scott Avenue, just a few blocks away. Cap the, both sides of the street have little curb cuts to feed uh, with stormwater street trees along both sides of the street. It's a beautiful sort of capstone downtown project. Check it out. From the grassroots, this is a, again just south of the U of A, the Rincon Heights neighborhood. This is something that neighbors created. They just dug basins, planted trees, and this one captures stormwater from the sidewalk next to it. You can catch stormwater as well from parking lots. Uh, they generate huge amounts of runoff, as well as those pollutants. And this is a University of Arizona parking lot that takes some of its stormwater and uses it to feed street trees as well. Moving out into the street now, so starting to think about maybe those streets aren't just for cars. Maybe the places where we live are for us, too. So the traffic circle's been around forever. It's a great traffic calming device. But when we partner it with these green infrastructure methods, a flush curb all the way around, a depressed interior that's earthen, it's permeable, this captures, so it uh, reduces the amount of stormwater flowing in the street. It cleans some of that stormwater. It calms traffic. And it passively irrigates that tree, which in turn shades the asphalt beautifies the intersection. You get the picture. This is a chicane or a bump out. It's the same principle. We built these streets like 70 years ago that are like 50 feet wide for carriages. I'm not sure what happened. But anyway, we have to go back <laughs> and create these bump outs so people will drive more slowly. But now we're catching storm water in them. Uh, this, these were the first ones where this was done a couple of years ago. And um, in con near conclusion, what I'd like to say, what, I, what excites me about this uh, the most and what sets Tucson apart is that in cities like Philadelphia and Chicago and Portland, Oregon, this green infrastructure thing is really catching on across the, across the nation. But here, what's special is that it comes from people. It comes from the grassroots like you and me. And it comes from people in neighborhoods and organizations and individuals uh, just going out and doing it. And that is actually pushing the policy in this case. And so this is just a photo of a, a morning workshop where people got out and transformed 150 feet of right of way into a, a rain garden. Reclaiming these neighborhood spaces for neighborhoods. Painting out in the street. It's fun. It also calms traffic down. And it says this is a place for people, too. Sometimes you can even just close down the street entirely, if only for a day, have some food and music while you're building these things. So it's just to conclude, um, if there's one, two things I'd encourage you to do. One would be to get involved. In Tucson, there's so many opportunities with nonprofits and informal groups and neighborhoods, individuals who are all doing this stuff. It's so easy to find. Um, so I'm not going to tell you how to do that. You're resourceful people. But uh, the other thing is, remember the muffin tin. <laughs> Put on your muffin tin glasses when you go out and imagine what we could do if we were just turn it upside down. So thank you very much. <laughs>